without further ado, let's uh, welcome Oliver on stage. Uh, Oliver is a very special guest uh, to me. He's one of the best engineering leaders I know. He's also building uh, probably my favorite product ever, which is Coda. Uh, I'm a big fan, we're a huge fan of Coda at, at Plato. And Oliver, thank you for building the great engineering team that is building this great uh, product. Uh, Oliver, welcome. Thank you, Quan. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for the kind words uh, about myself and the product. Um, like Quan said, um, I'm running the engineering team here at Coda. And um, before I joined Coda two years ago, I was I spent most of my life, 14 years, um, at Google as an engineering VP, building products like Google Shopping and Travel and uh, many YouTube products under the YouTube creator team. So with that, let me um, pull up my slides here um, and maybe start with what is Coda um, because that influences the rest of the talk. So Coda is an all-in-one document. That means it brings together documents, spreadsheets, and presentations all in a single tool. And it allows people to build documents that are as powerful as apps. And a key feature of Coda is what we call a Coda pack which basically allows people, users, to integrate and manipulate their data from other tools like Jira, GitHub, Salesforce, uh, Gmail, Google Calendar, Teams, Zoom, literally hundreds of tools, as you can see some of them in the, in the animation down here. And that enables you to build documents in Coda that behave like apps. They can send emails, they can send slacks, they can text people on their phone, they can schedule meetings, create opportunities, and of course, they can use AI to do smart stuff, summarizing meetings or generating text tables or images. And by the way, the images in the rest of the presentation were generated by AI in this presentation. So if they look a bit weird, blame it on the AI and not on me. But basically, Coda is a productivity app. And as part of working in a company that's building productivity apps, we internally obsess about a lot about productivity rituals. Uh, which has led to this talk. We call them rituals. This actually goes back to Bing Gordon, uh, partner at Kleiner Perkins and uh, previously at AEA, because he has this quote of every company has a small list of golden rituals. They are named. Every employee knows them by their first Friday and they're typically templated. Examples that you've probably heard of would be the six pager ritual of Amazon, or Google's TGIF or Google's OKRs. Uh, I recently encountered an interesting one uh, when I talked to David Wiesen, co-founder at Nextdoor, who told me about their Mac Rip ritual, which is also an amazing ritual that the engineering team is doing. We can talk about more about that uh, at the end, or maybe someone from Nextdoor is in the audience and can tell us about that one. Uh, besides the golden rituals that are company-wide, Typically, also every team has their own team-specific rituals that they use to basically express and shape the culture of their team. And based by this quote here that I totally made up, which is, I need to get more done with less by every engineering manager in 2023. Uh, inspired by this quote, um, I thought I'm going to share four of my favorite rituals that uh, are both coming from our customers and that we all use internally in my engineering teams here at Coda. And all of them, I wish I would have known about them 10, 15 years ago when I started my career because I would have used them like every single day, every single week back then. So without further ado, let me start with Dorian Pulse. This is, if you look at Coda as a company, this is our marquee golden ritual. Like every person joining Coda, not just the engineers, everyone will encounter Dorian Pulse probably within the first hour or two of joining Coda. And it's actually used so often that, by the way, the presentation here is a, a Coda document so that I can give uh, life examples. Uh, the, uh, if I do a slash, I, I, I pull up a shortcut. But basically, um, we've templated this. And if I gave this presentation internally, I would have basically, the first thing I would do on a slide like this, uh, I would add Dorian Pulse to the page. It's basically two components. Dory is basically giving me a tool, a table, where the audience in, of the meeting is basically adding their questions so they don't have to interrupt my flow. They can basically asynchronously add questions. 
and vote on other questions so that the top voted questions bubble to the top and we can talk about well, what's the most important question rather than running a meeting where the loudest person or the highest ranking person or so dominates the questions that get asked. We want the best questions to get asked and discussed. And Pulse is basically a way of sentiment tracking where I could basically get the group's uh, um, intelligence on a key question of the meeting. So how do you feel about whatever, renaming Dory to something else? Um, and, and then people would add their sentiment and that way I can gather feedback from everybody in the meeting. Uh, again, without having to do these boring rounds where 30 people all have to talk and say something and, 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 and time is wasted on that. I'll show you a very concrete example. I mean, this is a clean template that I added here, but let's show you a very clean example from my engineering staff meeting. So my engineering staff meeting, this is literally just copied over from a different doc that I run my engineering staff meeting from. Uh, we start my staff meeting with Pulse, which means the first five minutes, people basically add what's currently top of mind for them in a table, and they create how they currently feel in like one to five. Um, and then when people are done writing, they press this button so that I get a feeling for when we can move on and they read each other's sentiment. And that way we're basically all on the same page in the first five minutes. Um, and we're leveraging the fact that people can read way faster than they can talk. And very often interesting things bubble up as part of the sentiment that we then add to the agenda uh, and address. And in, I can recall many, many instances where just a simple ritual of doing sentiment at the beginning of the meeting kind of surfaced things that would have surely turned into big fires, but we caught them early and were able to ext extinguish them before they actually started burning. So that story in parts, which brings me to the next ritual. Uh, like at Google, like in my teams at Google, we're structured in highly cross-functional ways. So our engineers are working closely with their designer and with their product manager as a cross-functional team. Some of our teams are even more cross-functional where we have marketing um, or coder coaches embedded in the same team. And the challenge of every cross-functional team is why well, you have to juggle a lot of balls at the same time and you have to basically be permanently aligned and stay aligned uh, and constantly prioritize and work on the most important things. And the information for that is often distributed. Um, and that can be like a friction point for staying aligned. Uh, so our ritual to solve that is what we call a um, team hub. And that is probably what we see our customers use the most as well. Um, we obviously internally using Coda for this, it's not the only tool you could do this in, but I think it's the best tool for that. Uh, the idea of a team hub, and I'll contrast this a bit to how we did things at Google, uh, is that we pull in all the information that the team needs on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week job together in a single place, like this document with the different pages here. There's information about the team. They maintain their roadmap in here. The OKRs for the team get pulled in from the central OKR document, but then get managed and updated here on the same page. At Google, that would have already meant you have to go open another tab and go to a completely different tool uh, to manage your OKRs. Then the document the team is writing, like PRDs, uh, mocks, and design docs, are all maintained and written in the team hub itself. So there's never a question where to find something. Uh, you never have to whatever go back to, like I had to do in my old life often, find some six months old email that had a link to the design doc and then dig it out from there. And because it's all in the same doc, we can cross reference. Okay, this design is for this item on the roadmap, which is currently slotted to launch, whatever here. Um, makes all of these things simple. I'm a big believer in giving teams an extremely high degree of freedom on how to exactly manage their daily tasks. So this team here, by the way, I took this from the PAX team, uh, one, of, one of the engineering teams here. Uh, they do it as in the form of story-based and in the form of a table view. Other teams use Kanban view and, and very different methods. So there's no standardization for us on how teams manage tasks. I believe teams should decide that themselves depending on the specific situation of the project that they're in. Um, 
dashboards and keeping track of metrics. Like for example, we restore our code in GitHub. So staying on top of what's happening with pull requests in GitHub is a very important aspect of managing teams. So here the teams pulled in their GitHub requests. They see a pull request. They see how they're currently distributed across the team and they see what's running stale and they can use that in their team meeting to, to address. Speaking of the team meeting, team meeting notes are an invaluable source of information. So obviously we store them in the team hub as well so that we can search over them as we search over everything else. And then again, there's a lot of freedom on how teams run their team meetings. You see some elements of Dory and Pulse that I mentioned earlier, like here's Dory, for example, uh, in, in how the teams manage themselves. I like to show this team's team hub because they have a fun aspect in their meeting. Meetings have a social function too. Um, and so they share weekend pictures as part of their weekly kickoff meeting and other elements in the team hub, like a wiki and so on. So this basically allows teams to basically run out of a single, basically tap out of a single home yeah, and manage all the information from there. Um, and we often have people also on top of the team hub have an, like a personal hub, an individual hub. Like I have one for myself. I have all kinds of information as the head of engineering that I want to stay on top of. This is a sample page I copied in from my personal hub. So what I've done here is I've pulled our GitHub information, all the pull requests from the last, I think, six months, three months, I think. Uh, no, sorry, six months. Uh, counted the average per engineer and cross-referenced it with the engineer starting date and then created a view for myself where I see the people who started six months or later. How are they ramping up? so that I can spend my valuable management time honing in on people that are ramping up slowly and figure out what we've done wrong here, but also learn from people that have been like ramping up spectacularly fast. It's just a simple, simple way of just tuning the team up a bit and giving it a bit of a different spin. And now I mentioned the dreaded word of meetings already. I'm a um, passionate fan of not having unnecessary meetings. Um, so I want to pull up another ritual that I feel very strong about. It's a, a ritual about meetings, and we call it internally the low meeting week. And if you would call my team and ask them about their favorite ritual at Coda, this would probably show up at number one or number two. Um, the, the story behind this is we were running last year on a cadence, on a weekly cadence, where we kept a Wednesday's meeting free. Um, so all our company-wide meetings and one-to-ones and so on would spread across four days of the week. And then we picked a single week each month where we flipped the cadence around, where we basically said, okay, let's have four days of no meetings and squeeze in all the meetings into a single day. The exact details we left to the teams, uh, but we saw a big boost of productivity when we did this. Um, but we also, and I'm happy to go into more details if it's of interest for anyone in the audience later. We also sometimes overdid it and saw that too few meetings is kind of uh, not great um, either. As I said, happy to share a bit more information if it's interesting. This ritual is just one out of a ton of rituals that we use internally, and many of them are taken uh, or inspired by what we hear from our customers um, in how we kind of manage meetings, not just the amount of time spent in meetings or the efficiency of a meeting, but also the timing of these meetings. Like a big believer in uh, deep focus time and basically arranging meetings in a smart way so that it creates enough in between time for engineers to be able to basically work on a really hard problem without getting pulled out by the next meeting again. And now, and with an eye on um, wanting to jump to the q and I want to pull up one more of my favorite engineering rituals um, at Coda. And I wish I would have had that idea like a decade earlier. We call this the Shippathon. And the background for this ritual was that um, we had a whole lot of engineers um, that were working on long-term projects that like took a quarter, sometimes actually significantly longer than a quarter to ship. And we wanted to pull them out of that longer term uh, uh, work and basically spice up, um, uh, spice things up a bit um, uh, once a quarter or once every other quarter. 
Uh, and that's why we basically experimented with shipathon. So the idea here is that coming up to a shipathon, we're collecting ideas for small features in a very bottom-up way. So the engineers fill out the table, the designers, product managers as well. A uh, table of, uh, of um, feature ideas that um, are quite small and can be done in a, in a, short, number, a short amount of time. We vet the table, of course, by technical feasibility and whether we would want them in the product or not. And then the designers go off for a sprint like about a week or two before the actual Shippathon event to basically have rough mocks for like a long list of features. And then for the Shippathon, the engineers take half a week where they drop their main project and where they pick from that list of Shippathon ideas. They typically pick the ones that they've put there themselves, but they could pick anything on the list. Uh, and then they have three days to basically build the feature, write the tests for the feature, and ship it. And then typically by the end of Friday, like the last time we ran the Shippathon, uh, we had, I think it was slightly less than 30 people, 30 engineers participating, and we built 40 features in three days. And some of them were quite significantly really good, strong features that added to the product. Um, we run other related rituals as well. I'm happy to go in detail if, if, if of any interest, like a hackathon and a packathon. But with that, I want to jump and open things up for questions or any interest of what to dive more deeply in. What shall we talk about? What's more interesting? Also want to tease up again, Kwang mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, there's a circle about rituals and like crafting your own rituals to improve the productivity of your team or solving some other specific need of your team that we're starting on May 30th. So with that, let me switch to the other tab. I'm back. Um, thank you, Oliver. Um, it was awesome. I'm a big fan of uh, Pulse. Uh, we're doing that every week, uh, too. I'm a big fan of focus time um, myself, and I encourage all my team to have at least three or four hours of focus time every day. So we have all our meetings only in the mornings, so that uh, our afternoon is really only for focus time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I love the ship pattern. I, we actually, right now, in uh, an off-site um, a hack week, and um, that yesterday was, uh, we had an expectation, which was everyone in the company had to commit uh, something. So the technical or not technical, um, everyone should be able to pull the code, um, ship something, uh, even it's just a simple wording, hello world, whatever, uh, with chat GPT and with all the tools that exist now, um, there's really no technical barrier to, to, to do that anymore. Um, so it's fascinating. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we have uh, questions from uh, the audience. So uh, everyone feel free to go in the Q&A section, add your questions as well as uh, voting for the one uh, you want me to, to ask Oliver. Uh, I guess the first one is if you found any team rituals that um, tend to be counterproductive, how have you addressed them? I guess that sometimes adding um, too much process or ritual is actually slowing things down. So any example of something you had to pull up? Yeah. Um, the, I mean, we constantly um, <clears throat> experiment with, experimenting with rituals because we hear good stories from our customers. Yeah. So we often try out new stuff. Uh, and not everything is sticky and we don't, we, we, not everything sticks. Uh, a thing where we've overdone it so that it became counterproductive, I hinted at that a bit earlier. Uh, when I talked about the low meeting week. So um, it took us a while to find a sweet spot of number of meetings to turn. First of all, I say we optimize every week to have enough deep focus time, uh, but we find it useful to every couple of weeks, just flip it around and have extra much deep focus time. Uh, but originally when we built this, we had it actually be a no meeting week, simply because that's the ritual we had at Google. So we just blindly, I blindly copied that. And we had a meet, like, we tried to have a, a week where we had literally no meetings. Um, and I measured the impact in GitHub because I can easily do that. Uh, but we also sent a survey to get a qualitative feedback after each week. And um, 
a lot of people that were new to the company felt like they could not be productive without the meetings. And even some of the senior established engineers felt they were not enough meetings and therefore Slack exploded and other interruptions yeah, uh, that mm -hmm. were less efficient for that. So that's how we tuned it and actually ended up in, oh no, we actually want to have like flip it around and have about a week, a day full of meetings in a week and four days of empty. That, that felt like the sweet spot. Um, and as I said, we measure this quantitatively, yeah, like a low meeting week boosts like engineering output by about 25% uh, immediately. But qualitatively, if I look at the qualitative feedback, I see people tackling stuff, yeah, that they've been tracking out for a long time and that they would have probably not tackled in their normal flows. I think the actual impact is way higher than that. Also, if you qualitatively look at that, many people basically report that subjectively they felt twice as productive. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes a quick meeting can solve um, a very long Slack thread. Um, so definitely. Yeah. And um, then it's also that social function of a team. It just feels better if you see other people's faces, especially if you're working. Yeah. Remotely. Especially if you're working remotely, um, especially the past two or three years, I guess. So um, the next question is about how, uh, how do we ensure that uh, some of the rituals are consistently followed? So that's a question I have myself too, which is, you actually have an idea of how things should be done, but half of the team is actually filling in the polls or half of the yeah. team is actually updating the OKR or like, what do you, what have you found? It's been working well. Yeah. So actually I have like two answers for that. They might be slightly contradicting, but the first one is I actually often just don't like if the ritual is good and positive, okay. I'd assume it will stick by itself and people will pick it up because they benefit mm -hmm. from it. And then there is no need to enforce it and so on. Yeah. But you might need to create the awareness at the beginning and expose people to it so that they actually give it a shot. I just introduced a new, a new ritual. I'm not sure if it will be successful or not. So that's why I didn't mention it. It's called bite sized learning. I feel very optimistic about it. Yeah. But we'll see if it sticks or not. I'll not force teams to use it, but I need to expose them to it often enough to, so that it gets kind of a fair chance. And what I'm doing mm -hmm. for that is I, um, the ritual itself is in a Coda document. Uh, but I actually, because a Coda document is easy to send Slack messages, um, I'll ping the team basically for a couple of weeks on Monday mornings with one element of bite-sized learning, with one lesson from bite-sized learning in Slack. Yeah. So I'm pushing it a bit and then we'll see if it sticks or not. And if it doesn't stick, the ritual then it doesn't add enough value and it's perfectly fine if it dies off. Yeah, I love it. It's a kind of self-selection of those rituals. And um, obviously, in the beginning, you have to give a little push, um, but there have to be small bites push, uh, small learnings in the exactly. beginning. And even if if it doesn't work even with that, then it's probably that was not a good ritual. Yeah. Awesome. All right. The next one is about... Um, individual team members' goals. Um, do you have uh, the ritual of setting the individual team's uh, member goal quarterly? Um, how do you measure the success of those individual goals? That's a question from uh, Bota. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So what we are doing at Coda, and I'm running the company-wide planning process as well. So I'm obsessing a lot on how we do planning and how we do goal setting. We're using an OKR framework, like many companies, we're using OKRs and in the early days of Coda, that was on a six-week schedule. Um, mm -hmm. But when I joined, we switched that to a quarterly schedule. So it's pretty similar to that. Uh, and we set annual targets as well as quarterly targets. But they're set at the team level. Um, we have the option to do personal OKRs broken down, but we don't enforce that. The way we do our OKRs, however, is a bit different than we did this at Google. So we have a very strong culture of having a... Um, like for each key result that there's what we call a DRI or a driver, like an individual person, like only a single person, it literally force can only be one, uh, who's responsible for tracking that OKR. It's not necessarily the person who has to do all the work. It's often teamwork, so definitely not the person, but that's the person who makes sure that the actual OKR itself is in a good shape, that it gets updated every week, that if it runs into issues, it gets escalated. Uh, and that contributes a lot of the quality to the quality of the plans because there's a very clear person, yeah, responsible for, for that aspect of the plan. Uh, 
The second thing in uh, related to planning, it's not directly coming up in the question, but I considered putting it on one of the slides and then dropped it off. So I'll use that to sneak it in here right now is, um, so we spent two weeks a quarter planning when I joined. So roughly two out of 12 weeks were spent in planning. Okay. And um, I changed that a year ago to a single week. So we've yes. condensed that down because there's a, like an opinion that I have about planning and that planning is fantastic, but execution is how you win. Uh, and I want to limit the amount of time spent planning to 10% or less. Yeah, so 12 weeks, if you can do all the planning in a week. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe have a day of discussion before the planning cycle starts, then you're about like below 10%. Um, that was controversial when we like forced it uh, in, in, into the team. So we ran it first as an experiment. It was spectacularly successful, both in terms of feedback we got because everybody was happy they had an additional week of execution. But way more importantly, the actual plans were objectively measurable better. If we look at OKR completion scores of those plans. We wrote or, or the number of KRs that were stuck at zero and never progressed, that was measurably lower than before. So yeah. shorter time planning led to better plans for probably, we could argue a lot on why that's the case, um, but um, basically forcing people to really, in a planning week, you do nothing else but planning, which means you cannot do that, sustain that for more than a few days. Yeah, draft really good plans and then immediately go back into execution. Yeah, uh, so shorter and better quality uh, yeah. planning. Um, just a follow-up question is how many people are involved in the planning and does it take 100% of their time for that week? So how do they vote? I uh, know, sorry. How many people are in, uh, involved in that planning? Yeah. And so we, yeah. does it so, take full time for them during that week? Yeah, so basically we are completely fine in blowing up everything for a week so that everybody participates in planning. Uh, okay. And we do two cycles of um, basically it starts with top down guide. It actually starts with reflection where we look and learn from execution mm -hmm. of the previous quarter that yield fields into top down guidance. So that we kick off planning the, on a Monday with clear top down guidance of what we want the teams to focus on. And then the bulk of the week is spent with bottom up people writing their OKRs, uh, each team and everybody's involved. And that means that from Monday to Wednesday, well, they'll do very little but writing their plans. And then we have the last two days of the week to do another top-down trimming things down uh, because teams tend to be overloaded. Uh, and then a, a, basically another bottom-up cycle where teams say, okay, this works now. Um, and it all ends with a presentation of every team to the entire company of the, of the high-level plans, of the top-level things they're doing. That's super interesting. So it's a combination of top-down top down and bottom-up and the whole company everyone, every single person in the company is involved for yeah. a full week. Yeah, yeah. And to, uh, to, to go back to Bota's question is, in the end, everybody in the, our OKR document has a page that's called My Dashboard. And in that My Dashboard, they see the OKRs that they are basically working on. Either they're directly responsible for it because they're the DRI or it's their team's OKRs. Yeah, so people awesome. can very easily track what they have to do in their dashboard. Awesome. We have another question about uh, how many engineers do you have in a team, how ge geographically diverse they are, and how do you handle time zone? Oh, this is a wonderful question. Thank thanks for asking that. The, so the code engineering team right now is 81. I think we had someone. Yeah, it was 81 right now. So uh, slightly below 100. Um, we are completely distributed in U.S. time zones. Um, not 100% sure if... Everybody's really in the U.S. all the time, uh, but uh, they have to basically work in some U.S. times on East Coast or West Coast. Um, the We have certain hubs where there's more people like San Francisco, Seattle, here in Mountain View and in New York. There's larger clusters of engineers, but you can literally be anywhere. So we're basically optimizing our processes so that we can be completely distributed team. And that basically means because we are not physically co-located, there is a need to physically co-locate people uh, once a quarter. So typically each team, each smaller team gets together every quarter. We also run quarterly hackathons as a, as a way to have people be in person with many other employees. We also do that quarterly. Uh, we get the entire company together once a year. 
And in our like day to day and week to week rituals, I mean, I showed you the team hub and the way this is built is often trying to reduce the number of in person meetings you might need to have so that if you're in a time zone that allows you to work early, you can still be in touch and on the page. Or, for example, use the Dory ritual to leave feedback on something without having to be there. Um, yeah. I feel very passionate about making this distributed nature work because my career started in Europe when I worked for Google. So I was nine hours away from the headquarter and the amount of late night meetings I had to have is just something I don't want anybody else to experience. Yeah. And gives also the freedom to maybe want to travel uh, as even though they're based in the US. Exactly. I've been doing that a lot for the past two or three years. Yeah, I know. Um, You're in France. The right rituals. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a questions about the performance of a team. So how do you measure, what metrics are you using to measure the performance of a team? Because I suspect that for engineering, it's not as straightforward as for a salesperson, for example, or for a marketing person. Yeah. Um, so how do you do for engineering teams? Yeah, there is no general answer that works for all the engineering. It's very different. Like you can measure some teams on like feature output and, and judge the complexity of that. You can drill in, look at code output, even so they're very dangerous and very easily flawed metrics, but nonetheless can be worth uh, looking at them. I mostly look at basically the actual achieved impact. Yeah, in t in t typically then measure it in terms of feature output, except for if it's a specialist team, I don't know, like a security team, you would not measure by how many, like how much code they write, even though that's part of their job too, but well, how, <laughs> how, 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 if they screw up or not. Um, it's a tricky topic. Uh, it helps a lot that we do OKRs and planning and that it involves a heavy element of top down and bottom up. Yeah, because then we can also measure on okay, how good are teams in actually achieving the plans they commit to, which plays a role in judging. Judging. Are you well. using a lot of those tools to uh, measure engineering metrics, um, t time to commit or put, put review? Just kind of no, we, like we, the... yeah. we, we, we track things, um, but we're not, uh, no, we're, we're basically, this is more on the, um, I, I find the, all these metrics are easily flawed. And once you pay attention to them and the team knows you're paying attention to this one metric or not, yeah, uh, they're too easily gamed and it's counterproductive. But then it's a distraction. It's much easier to directly go and, okay, what's the actual impact of the team? How hard was it to build? And could we, should we have done this uh, quicker or not? But when you mention impact, are you mentioning the impact, for example, the feature is shipped, or are you uh, talking about the impact of that feature on users' revenue conversion on what else? Because that can take months uh, after to actually measure it. Yeah. Right? So, so the, um, this is harder in a startup than it was at Google. At Google, it was a lot easier yeah. to measure. Like, I wouldn't care about the launch. I would care about the landing. So feature getting launched. That was only half of the story, actually, have it be successful in reality. That's what we aim for. But we had a ton of users at Google, and we could run a ton of experiments and holdbacks and parallels. It was quite easy to scientifically measure. It wasn't easy per se in absolute terms, but somewhat easier uh, to measure the actual impact of a feature, for example. That's why, like, from my Google days, was very much focused on the actual provability. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's much harder in a startup. You have much less traffic. You have much sophisticated setup. Yeah. yeah? Uh, you would have to sometimes like run a hold back and hold back a cool feature you just built from your yeah. for a subset of your customers for like a quarter to have enough uh, statistical evidence of proving that. That's typically not worth it. So I have become a lot more launch focus. Yeah. Uh, than, than I was just a few years ago, just out of necessity or out of pragmatism. Yeah, it depends a lot on the maturity of your uh, product, how the traffic you have, and and all of this. We are going to have actually an engineering Q and A dedicated on that topic: how to measure the impact of the feature you ship with the SVP of engineering of Amplitude. Amplitude is the analytic software that is actually trying to measure that. So she spent a lot of time thinking about this topic. So um, we, we're it, using it might... Amplitude as well, and it's awesome. So okay. yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Um, so ne the next question is really about how do you help your team prioritize which task uh, to work on? Um, so we saw in your roadmap that there were a lot of things that we're working on um, at the same time. How do you how do you do that? How do you focus on higher priority tasks? 
yeah, I mean, one key aspect here is the planning. Yeah. And the both being really clear in the priorities and the top down guidance of planning. Yeah. And having that additional iteration where you could really clarify the priorities during planning time. So that's number one. So you can then assume if we do planning well, then at least in planning week, yeah, we've been very clear on prioritizing and making very clear what's higher priority and what's lower priority. The second thing now is when execution week, it can be very easy to forget about the OKRs and the plans right. and just whatever, like get distracted by it. That's in part why, I, and that actually often happened to me like at, at Google because like OKRs live in one tool and the daily execution is in a completely different tool. Yeah, so you tend to not look at the OKRs very often. And then you get a reminder after six weeks, it's time to create the OKRs mid-quarter. And then you realize, oh, shoot. Uh, trying to avoid that and in the team hub that I showed by just basically incorporating the OKRs directly into the team hub. In the example that I had with the team meeting, actually, that was a great, not every team is doing that, to be honest. But that team was creating their OKRs in each of their team meetings. So they had their key, key results, and they were basically dragging a slider forward depending on where they were judging, where they were, as part of their, their weekly um, team meeting, which means they will not forget about the priorities and their KRs. Yeah. They're literally there every Monday morning. They look at them. Yeah. Um, there was an, also an engineer last week just made a comment about this. That was a good, it was a good, a, a good one. I just want to see if I can repeat it. So he said, it was a vacuum cleaner example. He said he always felt it's really silly that people buy a cordless battery powered vacuum cleaner because it's so silly because yeah, his old vacuum cleaner, you just plug it in. That just takes five seconds. It's really not a lot of work yeah, to plug it into the power plug and vacuum. And then he bought a vacuum powered mm -hmm. one and now he's cleaning a lot more and using it a lot more. So even a five second friction of going somewhere else and or, or plugging in a power plug. Yeah keeps people from going there and looking at it. So yeah, friction reduction matters. I think we have uh, time for uh, two more questions. Um, let's, uh, let's jump to the question about salary. Um, how do OKR impact uh, promotion and salary uh, raise at Coda? What are you looking at when you're deciding promotion and salary raise? Yeah, the OKRs do not directly impact that like at, at like at all like also because we don't break them down to an individual person level typically anyway so it wouldn't even be really feasible if we would want to but i would find that so very dangerous uh, that would basically guarantee if, if we were to do mm -hmm. that what it would lead to that in planning week that every single team every single person will lowball their ambition yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 it would be utterly destructive if there were any connection between that. No, to yeah. for promotion, first of all, on promotion, that's also a thing. I think too much obsession about promotion gets into the way of doing the right things. So the way um, the engineering job ladder here works and actually the entire company follows that principle yeah. is we have yeah. very few role stages. Yeah. So there's very few promotions because there's few stages you switch between. So the the Google culture of constantly having to talk to everyone about their next promotion and finding the right project that creates enough artifacts for the promotion. We just don't have that. Uh, yeah. We avoid that. Uh, salary raise, yeah, yeah, we look at overall impact on the company and we spend time to management team and significant time to discuss every single person individually and take all the information into account and calibrate on that. And basically, um, basically judge every individual's impact on the company historically and also forward looking. Um, yeah. So there isn't a, yeah. and it's not as simple as feeding in OKRs or yeah. anything else. It's a complex, it's why we need managers to do the actual management. Yeah. I love it. So um, actually decoupling OKR and salaries is actually helping to have people act on behalf of the company instead of the personal exactly. motivation. Yeah. Yes. Um, I love it. So we have two questions related to Shippaton. Um, first question is, how do you plan uh, Shippaton for backend platform teams that don't necessarily have user-facing features? And the second question is, um, what is a good frequency for Shippaton? Yeah, I mean, the short question on the first one is the platform teams, while they could participate in a, in a 
user facing shippers and if they would want to, but we don't have a shippers and ritual for platform teams. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, to be honest, they tend to have a bit more freedom in general on what they focus on and so on. So they don't have an equivalent ritual. Yeah. I would say they uh, have, however, a lot more independence on how they shape what they're working on each quarter. So the platform teams, we have a bit discussion at the beginning of the year on what are the four priorities for the year. We try to roughly assign one to each quarter. Yeah. And then have the rest of the org be all the other engineers be aware of those priorities. Yeah. And help and enable the platform teams to tackle down their big priorities that way. Yep. But there's no ship as an equivalent. Got it. Okay. And about the frequency, what do you think? For for Shippathon? Yeah. Um, this largely depends on the rest of the roadmap. So we haven't done a Shippathon this year, not because we couldn't and there wouldn't be enough there, but that's largely because the teams that would participate in the Shippathon, uh, almost all those teams have been working on uh, on smaller projects that ship really quickly. So we didn't, I find the Shippathon is the most useful if you have a lot of engineers tied up in longer term projects to break that longer term rhythm apart and have like a refreshing change of pace and get stuff out. Uh, and that's not how most of the core product teams um, have operated since February this year. So that's why we haven't had one in like last months. Yeah. But I'm okay. sure we'll do one okay. soon. Yeah. Okay. So it really depends on the roadmap. Um, exactly. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Awesome. I think we are uh, almost out of time. So Oliver, thank you so much for your advice, for your time, for um, for everything. Thank you so much for building Coda also.